So, uh, what are MR artifacts? Well, they're visual anomalies, um, which basically means that the features that we see within our resultant MR images that are not actually present in the original subjects. Um, many artifacts can occur during the MR examination. Um, some of them will affect the diagnostic quality of the image, while others can be confused with pathology, which, as you can imagine, uh, can be quite dangerous. Um, the artifacts can actually be classified into uh, four distinct groups. And I'll uh, discuss these individually as we go along. So they're patient related, signal processing related, hardware related, and contrast agent related. So I'll start off with the uh, patient related artifacts. So one of the biggest ones, and I'm sure you've all seen this uh, in your day-to-day -day work, is um, an artifact due to patient motion or patient movement. And it's estimated that between 10 and 15% of all MR scans need to be repeated due to this excessive patient motion during the acquisition. Um, we do need to give consideration uh, to the actual patient as to why they're, mo why they're moving. Um, the age can, it can be a factor, the disease process going on, the patient's actual psychology. Although some patients, as you're probably well aware, just cannot keep still. And we see these day to day. So some solutions. Um, motion correction sequences are now available. Um, these tend to use a radial case space filling technique. Uh, examples are um, propeller for GE, and um, blade in Siemens. Um, I'm getting the message saying that, um, are, you, are you all seeing the slides? Can I just pause for one second? Okay, so um, I'm getting a message. Everyone, uh, you should be able to see my slide, so I'll, I'll, I'll just carry on. Um, so I'll, I'll just go back. Um, apologies for that. Um, so solutions for motion artifacts would be uh, motion correction sequences, such as um, blade uh, on the Siemens propeller for a GE. If we take some time to speak to our patient, train, um, educate them before they actually go into the scanner, make sure that they're comfortable, make sure that they they know what's going on, then this will give you um, much much more um, much more of a of a of a gain in order to make sure that the patient keeps still. Uh, the use of immobilization aids. So as radiographers, we are all aware of um, the plethora of immobilization pads, sandbags we have. Use as many as you can. Um, that, that's what I always teach um, my, my junior radiographers. Use as many pads and sandbags as you can to make sure that the patient keeps still. Um, if all else fails, then obviously um, we need to consider some sedation. So this could be some oral sedation, such, such as a small dose of diazepam, or it could even go as far as giving a patient some uh, general anaesthetic. Obviously, these need to be done under medical supervision, and they're not done day to day. And of course, if all other um, if all else fails, other imaging techniques that a bit quicker, such as CT, may be an option for that patient. Okay, uh, the next patient-related artifact is peristaltic artifact. Um, we tend to see this, obviously, in when we are doing imaging of the abdomen and the pelvis. 
And this kind of imaging can be very tricky due to peristaltic motion of the bowel. Um, although it is a, a patient-related artifact, it's not so easy to control as it is, uh, it is uncontrolled physiological movement. So, again, the solutions could include fast imaging techniques, so utilising um, sequences such as single shot, fast spin echo, haste imaging, fist spin imaging. Uh, again, we can utilise our motion correction sequences. And also very important when, you, when you're doing any kind of pelvic imaging is um, good patient pr uh, preparation. Um, many places here in the UK, we do uh, tend to ask our patients to um, keep to a very low residue, low fibre diet um, before we do any uh, pelvic exams. And it, do, it does improve the image quality um, quite a lot. Um, the other uh, technique we can use, which is demonstrated on the images on the right-hand side, is um, an IV administration of hyacine butyl bromide. Um, this is a, a smooth muscle relaxant um, drug, and it's very effective. Now, um, again, I hasten to add, um, this, is o this is only allowed under certain um, PGDs, a patient group directives um, and it may not be appropriate in the country that you're practicing in um, but on the right hand side you can see the top image is uh, without um, hyacine butyl bromide and the second image is the exact same patient about five minutes later after administrating hyacine butyl bromide so it does help quite uh, quite a lot Okay, the next one is our breathing artifacts. Now, I'm sure we've all seen these. Um, again, they uh, occur in the thoracic and the abdominal region, and they are not very noticeable, and they contain very regularly repeated artifacts um, of ghosting of the abdominal and thoracic wall and the uh, subcutaneous fatty tissue. Um, this artifact will only occur in the MR image in the phase direction. And obviously they're caused by breathing motion of the thorax and the abdomen during the data acquisition. So the movement of this region during the data acquisition may cause a faulty encoding of the MR signals. Now data acquisition in the frequency direction is very quickly completed in an echo time of a few milliseconds, but the entire data acquisition in the phase direction will take much longer. Obviously, this is this is the uh, the product of TR um, and the matrix, and therefore um, it's very susceptible to movements during this time. So this is where we get multiple images known as ghosting in the phase direction. Now some of the solutions. Again, we must think about our patient comfort, educating and training. Maybe tell the patient to breathe gently. Utilization of breath hold sequences. This is coming more commonplace now. Uh, now they have much faster um, MR sequences. So you, you're thinking about your haste sequence, your single shots, your, um, your vibes. In some cases, putting an RF saturation band over the abdominal wall may help eliminate some of that fatty tissue. Um, I personally tend to use this um, on some of uh, on some of the patients who are t uh, much, um, you know, a little bit larger than normal, shall we say, um, and it will help get rid of that fatty uh, signal. Gating and breathing motion um, by using respiratory bellows or belts. We can, um, on the newer systems, we can gate the breathing motion by employing navigator sequences. So this is where we allow the software to detect the diaphragm in motion and it'll trigger at the appropriate time. Um, one of the important ones, which is 
overlooked is the correct use of the trigger points and the trigger windows for the gating techniques. Now, these are things that you can actually um, look at yourself and um, optimize yourself based upon your, uh, your patient's breathing waveform. Um, obtaining correct trigger points and trigger windows will ensure the data acquisition is performed in the quiet or the expiration portion of the cycle and therefore you'll get much less um, breathing artifacts, if any. Employing parallel imaging techniques, again, such as Sense, Grappa, um, will help reduce your breath fall times and therefore reduce your breathing artifacts even more. And again, um, on the, on the newer scanners, we are now able to employ motion correction sequences to our abdominal and thoracic um, MR acquisitions. Uh, and again, this is using the radial case space filling techniques. So examples of these are propeller, blade, and multivane. Moving on to the next patient-related artifact. Uh, this is the pulsation artifact. So. This tends to happen um, from larger arteries um, within the field of view. And as you can see on the top right image, uh, the, these are um, goes, you can see the pulsation artifacts coming from the, from the iliac and the, the femoral vessels. They manifest as very high signal intensities. Uh, they are very regular and equidistant um, in the phase direction. And you can Occasionally view these on axial spine images, again in the phase direction due to um, the pulsation of um, the CSF. So some solutions, um, sorry, before we go to the solutions. So arterial blood and CSF will high, appear as high signal intensities in many pulse sequences, um, typically your T2 sequences, obviously and these are subject to continuous pulsation movements. So in our axial sequences, the fluids will pulsate orthogonally through the image plane, and this will um, result in the fluids experiencing a phase change. So as we acquire the individual lines of case space, the pulsation signal um, components are repeated in the phase direction and these equidistance encodings are in, superimposed in the wrong position in the image. And this is why pulsation artifacts will appear only in the phase direction of the resultant MR image. So some of our solutions. So utilize peripheral vascular or ECG gating, where we synchronize the acquisition with the patient's heartbeat um, the only downside on this is that it will prolong the acquisition um, considerably in some cases. Uh, use RF saturation bands to saturate the signal from the blood vessels. So we saturate the signal as the blood comes into our um, field of view. So therefore, um, this will reduce the pulsation artifact. And because our, our pulsation artifacts always occur in the phase direction, um, if at all possible, consider swapping the phase and frequency direction. And kind of linked to pulsation artifacts, we have flow artifacts. Um, these are artifacts that can occur near any vessel, um, but generally um, we see them more often than not in cardiac MR. And again, it's a high signal intensity uh, distortion in the phase direction, and it just appears um, as a, a signal rich blurring and distortion. And you can probably see that in the image on the right hand side where the, the blood in the, in the left ventricle of the heart, um, it just looks extremely blurred and, and, and very, very um, signal rich. So the, the reason for this is obviously the blood is flowing um, through the heart, and this um, this is basically our motion, if you like. So again, as the lines of case space are required, the blood is flowing um, through these uh, slices, and it leads to this uh, diffuse signal-rich um, 
artifact again in the phase direction. And again, it can be suppressed by correct use of placement of RF saturation pulses. Um, and obviously, you need to make sure that your cardiac gating is, at, is actually um, up to date. Um, on a Siemens scanner, pressing the capture cycle will always help in this, uh, in this case. So um, that's the end of the um, patient motion artifacts. I'll just take a quick a sip of water. And then we are now moving on to signal processing artifacts. So these are kind of artifacts that occur due to the signal processing or um, on the software, um, which leads us to our, our resultant MR image. So the main one um, that we probably see every day, day in, day out, um, is our aliasing or our wraparound artifact. And um, it occurs when the field of view is smaller than the body part that's being imaged. Um, any part of the body that lies beyond the edge of the field of view is projected onto the other side of the image. As you can see in the, in the top right, um, we've got the, uh, a nice image of the, of the right uh, humerus and uh, a very kind of um, bad wraparound artifact of the left humerus uh, coming into the image. But th this can be easily corrected. So increase your number of phase encoding steps. Obviously, enlarging your field of view, not always practicable. But it's um, it's one of the the, the considerations, you can, considerations you can think of. Applying anti-aliasing software. So here I'm talking about things like no phase wrap, um, phase over sampling, this kind of um, stuff that you use day in day out. Switch the phase and frequency directions. Um, again, it may help, but um, just consider if you're, if you're sw swapping your phase direction from right left to head to foot, um, you might end up with aliasing in the opposite direction. Uh, one of the things that you can do is switch off coil elements outside the field of view. Um, this is possible if you're doing um, examinations such as lumbar spines, um, large field of view um, MSK work such as humerus, femur. Um, just switching off unused coil elements will always help. Use of RF saturation bands where possible. Uh, please remember that when you do use RF, uh, extra RF sat bands, um, we are increasing the SAR burden on the patient, so that needs to be considered. Um, however, the artifact may be useful in order to cut down scan times um, when we're scanning small field of views, such as uh, pituitary. Um, so you can see the image on the right-hand side. Um, this is a technique I use quite a lot providing the radiologist happy with the image. Uh, introducing this wrap into the image will um, maintain a, a half decent clinical scan time. Um, but if you are th going to go down this route, please make sure your radiologist is, is happy with it. Um, but it, it is worthwhile. You possibly on that image alone, you're probably saving about one and a half, maybe two minutes worth of scanning time. So sometimes aliasing artifact can be our friend. Okay, so magic an angle artifact. Uh, this is not a very well-known artifact, and I guess you have to look very, very carefully in order to, uh, to, to see it in our day-to-day -day image. Um, it's an artifact that occurs on sequences typically with uh, the shorter T's less than about 32 milliseconds. So typically we're looking at T1 weighted, our PE and our gradient echo um, sequences. And it's confined to regions of very tightly bound collagen, which are 54.74 degrees from the main magnetic field. Um, and the artifact um, looks hyper intense and therefore it can be mistaken for tendinopathy. So I don't know if you can see on the on the top right image of the knee, there's, um, there's some high signal um, shown by the white arrow. 
and also on the image of the shoulder on the bottom this high signal um, depicted by the arrow is actually due to magic angle artifact and not due to tendinopathy so um, the norm normal appearance is a lack of signal um, and this is on account of the restricted water molecules in the tight bound collagen causing very short t2 times so I'm afraid I have to do a little bit of physics here. It's not my favorite topic, but um, there's no other way of explaining this. So when the molecules lie at 54.74 degrees, um, we get a lengthening of the T2 time, um, which corresponds with an increase in the signal. So therefore, in our shorter TE sequences, our T2 signal doesn't decay significantly before the scanner picks up the signal. Now, the reason it is due to quantum mechanics, and um, I'm not going to explain that any further because that's a, a one-hour lecture in itself, I guess. Um, but uh, you, you can go and read, read, read up. Um, typical sites um, for the magic angle artifact are the proximal um, posterior cruciate ligament, the infrapatella tendon of the tibial insertion. Um, you can see that just on the left-hand side image here. And the femoral condyle cartilage and our supraspinatus uh, tendon. So, what are our solutions? So, bit of an obvious one, really, but um, use sequences with a longer TE. Um, I don't know how, if you have access to three Tesla scans, but this effect appears uh, much less at three Tesla. Okay, moving on to uh, our next signal processing artifact, and this is the B0 field in homogeneity. So um, they're typically called MWA fringes, and their interference pattern commonly seen when we use um, gradient echo um, sequences to acquire our images using the, um, the internal um, transmit receive body coil. So it occurs because of um, the lack of perfect homogeneity of the main magnetic field from one side of the body to the other. So essentially what happens is that we get aliasing of one side of the body to the other, and this will result in the signals of different phases being superimposed. And alternatively, um, they add and cancel each other out. So the um, we, we see this as banding artifacts or banding appearances and hopefully you can see them uh, these uh, these artifacts in the bottom corners of this image of the of the abdomen so the imperfections of the external magnetic field will increase the further we distance from the isocenter as well so again these artifacts tend to be seen in a larger um, field of view sequences uh, spin echo sequences are much less sensitive than gradient echo sequence, uh, uh, sequences. And um, when we move on to our faster gradient sequences, such as our fiestas and the true fisps, or the balanced FFEs, these are extremely uh, sensitive to B0 in, uh, in homogeneities. And you will see um, the, this banding artifact more often than not on these large field of view um, fast gradient sequences. And just a little uh, slide for interest, really. So these effects are actually much worse at higher field strengths. So um, I don't know if anybody's had the opportunity to work on a Sam Tesla scanner. Um, I personally haven't yet. Um, this image is actually referenced at the end of the, of the, of the presentation. But you can see that these banding artifacts are much, much greater at Sam Tesla than they are at 3 Tesla. <coughs> Excuse me. The next signal processing artifact is um, what we call gradient non-linearities. So these artifacts are quite uh, easily recognizable um, as they appear as a geometric deformities of anatomical structures. And more often than not, they are, you, they are manifested in large field of view coronal and sagittal acquisitions. 
um, at the margins of the, of the image. So um, the top image actually shows you a, a phantom image showing you the the, um, the actual um, distortions um, due to the non-linearity of the gradient. And the bottom image will show you the... Um, the effect we get when we do large field of view MSK imaging, you can see a kind of a bowing of the um, of the tibia and fibula, fibula at the bottom, and also at the uh, the femur at the top. So, in order to get distortion free imaging over the whole field of view, we need a good homogeneity of the main magnetic field as well as very linear gradients in all three axes. So the magnetic field and the gradient fields are actually known for each specific MR sequence uh, system, sorry, and therefore um, the manufacturers have software that can be used to predict and to actually correct for these geometric distortions within certain limits. Um, these are often called large field of view filters. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one of the other ways of um, eradicating um, this distortion artifact is to make sure that you scan as near to the isocenter as possible um, where the distortions are less. And if you could, um, please try and reduce the field of view. Um, even consider if, if we're doing large field of view femur imaging, um, Viewing, um, imaging it in two acquisitions, a top and a bottom, maybe. Um, and then we have fat saturation artifacts, and I guess you, you, you see, again, you see these day to day in your, in your daily MR life. So sometimes we have areas of varying size with indeterminate, indeterminate um, or bright fat signals. Uh, on fat sat images and these are fat sat artifacts um, so using spectral fat sat suppression can prove inadequate if a magnetic homogeneity is poor um, so it typically occurs around metal objects um, at tissue interfaces with different magnetic susceptibilities and where there's a significant variation in tissue shape occur. Okay. Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, we do see this happening quite a lot in patients with um, hip replacements, if we're scanning a pelvis, for example, uh, and also because of the um, of the very kind of awkward shape um, uh, when we're using uh, when we're doing breast imaging, uh, there's a lot of breast and air tissue interfaces happening, and this can have a significant effect on your um, on the ability of your system to to provide you with a decent fat sat. So um, some solutions: um, just make sure you you apply good um, manual shimming prior to your imaging. Um, on most MR systems nowadays, we have the ability to do bilateral breast shims, which will help your cause 100%. Manually tuning your fat and water peaks. Um, in order to do this, you, you do need to know what you're doing, what peaks you're, 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 you're tuning. So um, if you're unaware of how to do it, maybe speak with the application specialist or your lead radiographer, they should be able to help you. Um, and this will help you um, achieve a far better um, fat saturation. Um, something that I don't come across much day to day at the moment, but um, using saturation bags um, used to be popular around irregularly shaped body parts i have to be honest i'm not seeing a saturation bag in probably the last 10 years um, but i guess they, they still exist and if all else fails consider using a stir or um typically nowadays we use dixon imaging instead instead um which are much re less reliant on per perfect hom homogeneity 
Moving on to chemical shift artifact. So these are due to the spatial misregist misregistration of fat and water molecules. And uh, this is one of the few artifacts actually occur in the, in the frequency encoding direction. Um, it's due to the differences between the resonance frequencies of fat and water, um, because fat, as we all know, resonates at a slower frequency than water. So the misregistration of the pixels results in an artifact um, that looks like um, dark or white bands. And it could be between one to um, three or four pixels in width on either side of the anatomic object. So the artifact is most commonly seen around um, structures that contain a lot of water. So we're looking at things like the liver, the kidneys, optic nerves, the fecal sac. Um, these structures tend to be surrounded by fat. So you should be able to see the, the white banding um, on the top right image um, shown by the arrow. Um, this is obviously in the orbit. And also um, you get the, um, the bottom right image where you have on the, with a red arrow, you, you, um, you might not be able to see it, but there's a there's a slight um, uh, hyper uh, intense signal there. So some of the solutions for chemical shift: um, increase your receiver bandwidth if this is at all possible on your on your scanner. Switch your phase encoding direction, and manually increase your RF amplitude. Um, this is quite easy to do on a GE scanner. I'm not too sure how um, you'd go about it on a Siemens, Philips, or a Canon. So again, this is a question that you'd have to ask your local um, application specialist. Um, so again, a little bit of physics, um, because um, with chemical shift artifacts, we can actually compute in advance how much uh, of this chemical shift artifact we are likely to see within our um, image um, because it's a product of our receiver bandwidth and the size of our frequency encoding matrix. So I've put a little example down here. So if you're using a, a total receive bandwidth of 32 kilohertz and um, your total frequency encoding direction pixels is 256, so if we divide uh, 32,000 by 256, we get 125 hertz. So then the fat water difference at 1.5 is about 215 hertz. So the size of the chemical shift artifact will be 215 hertz divided by 125 hertz per pixel, which gives us um, a chemical shift um, computation of 1.7 pixels. That's just a, a quick example to, to show you how easy it is to um, to um, compute uh, our likely chemical shift. So going back to the previous slide, if you double your received bandwidth, then obviously our chemical shift um, calculation will be probably less than uh, 1.4 pixels, and therefore you're likely to, to see less of this artifact. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so our next uh, artifact is the Gibbs or the truncation artifact. Um, it's basically a series of lines that we see within our MR image. And um, they're, they're parallel and abrupt, and um, the intensity of the, of the lines will change. Um, so we tend to get this more often than not in uh, in the CSF, in the spinal cord, and also in the skull-brain interface. Um, so it happens at very high contrast boundaries. Um, and then the Fourier transform will um, correspond, correspond to this infinite number of frequencies. But MR sampling, as you know, is finite. So the discrepancy shown in the reconstructed image um, will be shown as a series of lines, and they can appear in both phase and frequency encoding directions. So solutions 
um, will be to increase the matrix. Now, this is one of the reasons why you may not be able to see um, the, the truncation artifact nowadays is because um, we use much higher matrix um, sequences nowadays because of uh, the technology will allow us to, to push the, the limits. Uh, when I first started working in MRI, probably about 22 years, 23 years ago, um, we were typically um, doing scans with 1 to 8 by 96 matrix, and therefore this artifact was much more apparent back then. Um, one of the other um, techniques you can do, use is to use, utilize smoothing filters. Um, and also a little trick, uh, if it's, again, acceptable by a radiologist, is to apply fat suppression if one of your boundaries happens to be fat. Um, and it tends to work well uh, with it within the brain. Okay, so moving on to uh, an artifact which is called dielectric artifact. Now, its dielectric artifact is present in all MR sequen uh, systems, but it's more often than not um, seen within body imaging on three Tesla systems. So, at three Tesla, the radio frequency wavelength will measure appro approximately 234 centimeters in the air, and the speed and the wavelength of this field is, is shortened. Um, to 26 centimeters within the body due to dielectric effects. However, 26 centimeter field of view is, is approximately the cross-sectional diameter of most body um, imaging studies. Again, it all depends on the size of your patients, but we use that as an average. So when your patient um, has uh, an abdo or pelvis diameter that exceed the RF wavelength. So this again could be uh, obese patients, patients with cirrhosis, ascites, or patients that may be pregnant. Um, basically, what we get are constructive and destructive interference patterns within within the within the image, um, and this will show up as darkening or shading at the centre of the image. At Sam Tesla, the RF wavelength in the tissue decreases to a lamb, and therefore this could be even worse. So hopefully you can see on the images on the right-hand side, this extreme shading right at the middle, um, and th this is all due to dielectric effect. So some of the solutions, switch imaging to a system that's less than three Tesla, not all, always appropriate, but um, consider this. Um, not something that we would do in the department, obviously, but you could ask um, the, the medical team to drain some of the ascites before we image a patient, if that's um, considered acceptable. Uh, utilize dielectric pads. Um, An OGE will, will uh, ship these as part of their um, three Tesla kits. I'm not too sure about the other um, manufacturers. And also something that um, I didn't mention on the solutions, but um, on our newer sequences, um, there are uh, opportunities to actually um, image a B1 map before we um, do our um, b before we do our, the image acquisition, and this will help correct um, for dielectric effect. Okay, moving on to partial volume artifact. So this is an artifact that occurs if the slice thickness is greater than the thickness of the tissue of interest. Um, again, it's it, it, you might consider this to be a kind of a, an old school artifact because with our newer systems, uh, the increased capabilities, we tend to um, image it maybe uh, thinner slices. So this artifact may not be as apparent. Um, but the reason it occurs is because um, if we have multiple tissue types um, encompassed within a single voxel. Um, so this is usually the case when we use thick slices. So if you look at the image on the top right, obviously we, um, we're trying to um, 
image the um, the the the, the, the cranial nerves here and you can see that instead of having a really nice thick black uh, cranial, ner uh, cranial nerve you see some mottling of the white um, which is due to um, the actual brain tissue um, being encompassed within that single voxel. So some of the solutions is reduce our slice thickness which is typically what we do nowadays day to day anyway. Increase your matrix and again, we, we tend to do this nowadays, again, because we have the ability with the, with the better um, MR systems we have. Next is the fat swap artifact. So um, also known as a permutation artifact. So this is a typical artifact that you might only, well, you will only see um, if you're performing a Dixon um, type method for your um, fat suppression sequences. And it's all down to um, computu computational errors in the areas of field in homogeneity. So basically, um, during the, the Fourier transform, the, um, the voxels containing the fat or the water um, are incorrectly uh, they're kind of incorrectly identified. So the images will show as fat being in one region and water. Um, so high intensity water may be swapped with low intensity fats and vice versa, depending if you're looking at your fat or water image. So if you have a look at the right hand side image, um, you'll see that part way down the neck, um, we have um, some fat saturation. Um, and this is, and this is actually in a uh, non-fat saturated image. So you can see the rest. I don't know if you can see my my pointer, but we have non-fat saturated here, and then fat saturated de depicted by the uh, uh, by the white um, arrows. It's probably clearly seen on the image on the on the bottom half where you you've got a very distinct halving of the abdomen where half of it is fat saturated and the other half is water saturated and again this is all due to computational errors um, there's nothing that you've done wrong um, as a radiographer um, very difficult to remedy but some of the solutions would be to use um, minimum faulty 